What is up, everybody? Ryan from Sports Card Radio. Tonight, Friday the 7th. I don't know when this podcast will come out, but tonight, Pearl Jam. Going into the Hall of Fame, I've probably seen Pearl Jam 25 times, probably over the course of my life. First time I saw it was in 8th grade, it was 1995, and there was just body parts flying everywhere and uh, clothing being thrown everywhere. It was quite quite the uh, scene. Ben Harper also played the opening set to that, uh, if anybody's familiar with him. That was way back in 95. That was the first time I saw him. Last time I saw him was in Fenway Park uh, just a few months ago, right after the National um, out in Boston. What an incredible experience that was. So I've probably seen him about 25 times in between then from 95 to 2006 they're going to be inducted into the rock and roll hall of fame tonight so congratulations to them but we got all things sports cards to talk about today or we got to touch on a little something different than sports cards at the end but we got all sports card topics try to move through them at a rapid fire pace first topic Industry Summit happened this past week. We'll touch about some of the comings and goings there. I have some inside information in the Panini Mickey Mantle deal there. What happened with Tops there? Well, we'll explain that deal and how that went down. Several other little bit of news um, items that we'll touch on out of the Industry Summit. Talk briefly about Tops now. First few cards of the year have come out. Personally, boy, if you look at the print runs, they're a little low with how hard they're hyping this thing. What's going on there with Tops? Now, thirdly, Upper Deck released some $100 silver coins. uh, And you get probably about a 1 in 100 chance of hitting a gold one out of these basically blind packs um, on Upper Deck EPAC. And while they are extremely expensive, they have sold well over it to date probably well over 700 right now and counting on the upper deck epac site you can only see the coins that haven't been locked or haven't been shipped already so just the ones kind of live that are available to be traded there are well over 600 coins available those were a hundred dollars each so you can do the math in your head how much in 24 hours got dumped into the Upper Deck PayPal account. Good to be Upper Deck, as I've mentioned uh, on these last couple shows. I think the last show where it was F-bomb-laced show about Connor effing McDavid. We'll try to keep this uh, clean today so that a uh, family-friendly show. Uh, and then last couple topics all about Amazon and eBay. Emma, Wow! Emma, wow, this is uh, exciting news. 47 orders in the last seven days. Uh, That's me dusting myself off. Just in the last couple days, I've bought so many boxes the last couple days. My the people are actually picking up the phone. It's it's amazing, you know. I've been in this hobby for for many many years. Had a hobby shop and you know pretty popular web, website that I made a nickel or two off of. You know nobody would ever pick up my phone, but I tell you what, once you start ordering a hundred boxes every day, phones picking up. Mister Tedder, how you doing? Ryan, blah, blah, blah. Everything's going great. Can't get these boxes uh, over to Amazon fast enough we'll touch briefly on that ebay uh some sales on ebay but also uh a couple mishaps we'll dive into those and lastly we have some questions that i've seen come across uh, facebook or the email specifically about the podcast a little bit about sports tickets to throw them in there at the end okay mickey mantle uh coming out of the woodworks looks like he hasn't had cards still about since about 2012 with tops the estate uh this it looks like there's a couple sons and maybe some other family and some lawyers involved there shopping around a card deal for mickey Mantle. obviously some interest from tops and panini tops was very very close to a deal maybe even thought they had a deal in hand um think about tops uh as we've discussed on this show it's a multifaceted company you have uh, uh obviously the baseball card business which uh if you're listening to this podcast that's certainly what you're familiar with there's also a very uh, 
depending on what you read, a pretty large candy uh, division. Uh, they call it confections, I guess. Uh, ring pops. You can basically find ring pops in quite a few stores. You think about the distribution of ring pops, it's certainly wider than the distribution of sports cards, at least from a brick and mortar perspective. That supposedly is like a $200 million a year sales and business. So that, that would be a lot more than what they generate from sports cards. Then this third division um, that has popped up recently, obviously, is Topps Digital, which is all the apps, Topps Bunt, Topps Star Wars Card Trader, top, you know, Topps Huddle, Topps Kick. There's like Walking Dead, there's UFC, there's probably like five other ones that I'm missing there. Well, supposedly what happened was is that Topps wanted to use Mickey Mantle, obviously, for their baseball cards. But they also wanted to use, have his digital rights so they could put those cards or certain versions of those cards in the Tops apps. And apparently from two different sources, this is what the hang up was. Obviously, Panini came in there with a strong offer. It may or not have been a hire. I don't know. I don't get to see paperwork and see money and documents, but I would, I'm sure it's, it was a competitive Offer now. There were some quotes from the Mantle Sons. This is a horrible move. First of all, I don't know who's advising these Mantle guys. Um, uh, there were there were some quotes. I don't know if it was from a Panini blog post or something or press release from the Mantle Sons talking about baseball cards and they, you know, supposedly a manufactured flooded the market and blah 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 blah. I wouldn't trust anything the Mantle Sons say about baseball cards because they just signed an exclusive with Panini America. Okay, it wouldn't mind me like if Mickey Mantle was still alive and he wanted to sign with Panini or whoever the heck he wanted. That really wouldn't bother me. But I mean, these sons to do this to Mickey Mantle is and this is one of the very few athletes that I would I think I could even you could even say this about. He might be the only athlete you could say this about Mickey Mantle is so tied to tops. Like I bet if you Google Mickey Mantle, it wouldn't take you that long to get to the images section and several, if not one of the first images is going to be the 52 Mantle card plus all his other cards. Mickey Mantle, part of his fame is tied to tops. Was he even, I wasn't, I wasn't, obviously wasn't around during that era. Was he even, he was a great player, certainly maybe one of the top five players in the game. Was he better than Willie Mays? Was he better than Ted Williams? Was he better than maybe some of the other guys that were playing in that era? Maybe or maybe not. He was obviously on the most high profile team in um, playing the most high profile of sports in a time when there was a lot of attention on baseball. So that certainly helped him. And over the years, his legacy and his lore has um, kind of you know, really helped, uh, you know, his, his, after he, after he didn't make, you know, hundreds of million dollars of playing baseball. It was really after his career that it was prolonged because of, I, I think in a lot of ways because of the growth of the game of baseball, but also because of his tops baseball cards. So for his sons or his advisors or the lawyers of the estate or whoever to make this decision, it is absolutely catastrophic business-wise. There certainly will be people who, you know, buy these cards and that you certainly could buy whatever you want. But to think that Panini won't mass produce these cards or Panini will somehow caretake the Mantle estate and, the, and treat Mantle cards with care um, is an absolute joke. Wouldn't have meant that much for Tops to get him. I don't think this is a huge loss for Tops. Now, you might say, well, why didn't they just say, well, we won't put you in the apps? I mean, that's a great question. That's certainly a good question to pose to Tops. But uh, again, they've put a huge investment into these apps. And I think they don't, they probably don't want to set a precedent that, oh, well, Mickey Mantle opted out of the digital. Well, I'm going to opt out of the digital. Or maybe they're going to have to sign two different contracts for everybody when they really just want to sign one contract that is both the the uh, trading card and the digital they don't want to start having to chop that up or th players uh, and agents and uh, people responsible for these guys as a state to think oh well maybe my digital rights are worth x amount and my trading card rights are worth this amount and i'll get more from them so 
Maybe that's a little bit of Top's thinking there. That's a little bit of me speculating. But from two sources, one of the major hangups was the fact that Mantle did not want to be a part of Top's Digital. The rest of the news out of the summit, at least for me, a little bit of a snooze fest. Run down a little bit of it here quickly. National Baseball Card Day. I saw people talking about this. I mean, I had a flashback to, back to the early 2000s or the 90s or whenever this idea got thought of. The way I think about Tops, I think they, they, you know, they're sitting around and they're spending all this money on these apps and they're spending all this money on the Tops now. And then, you know, around the industry, some of the time they're like, oh, shoot, we got to do something for these baseball card guys. So I think on the flight over, they're like thinking, 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 and then they're like, ah, we'll just do National Baseball Card Day again. And, you know, ah, we'll just do that. And, oh, Tom Fish, because, you know, we gave him 20 passes to the Transcendent Party and he got all this Chris Bryant stuff that's worth thousands of dollars. He'll, he'll close down his website for that day and we'll just, you know, that'll be a big spot. So what a snooze fest that is. I mean, great if you take part in it. Great if you're a store, you should definitely, this is just, this should be something you take part in. And, you know, maybe on that day, maybe you're, you can look at some pictures on Instagram or something from that day, but pretty much a snooze fest there. No black boxes. Ouch. Um, Wow. Uh, shocker there. Only 50. I, I, I have a dealer quote that he says just over 50 stores represented from the entire country at the summit. Another article I saw said over 60 were in attendance. So somewhere only between 50 and 60 shops and attendance at the summit. Overall attendance appeared to be about 200 People, according to I think one article that I saw, yeah, it looks like one article. Uh, back when I, you know, the year before I got banned, I think there were 500 people at this thing. So, despite the industry doing pretty well, a lot of people, you know, healthy, they've got their exclusives locked in place. Everybody can just kind of be in their lane, running in their own lane, and just you know, cherry picking the low hanging fruit that's out there in the sports card world. Um, don't have to bumper cars too many times, but uh, you know this this event has really shrunk in half, uh, really since uh, you know its heyday, and um, so I'm not really sure what's going on there. No post from the official industry summit Twitter account, Facebook, nothing, zero, no post while the event was going on. So certainly not a priority to get coverage going through there. Uh, next year, it's even moving to Dallas, probably in more of a cost-saving move. Again, this is this is a thing that that is run by Beckett. Um, Beckett actually bought it after I had gotten banned, so Beckett's not really involved in, in in me getting banned from the industry summit. But the guy running it um, st- was running it back in the day as well. So I'm not sure we, you know, the guy maybe have to get somebody else in there. Um, and do a better job with this if they want to boost attendance, but maybe it's not something they want to blow up too big. Next year's moving to Dallas again. That's probably more of a cost saving move. Uh, that's where Beckett is headquarters, so they don't have to move a whole bunch of stuff over to Vegas. Panini's obviously down there, and a lot of a lot of the industry kind of is uh, down there. Lots of good shops uh, down in that area. So actually, probably a smart move to move it down to Dallas. But again, the coverage really weak in terms of what's coming out of a summit. Again, nothing from the official social media accounts of the summit. It's a Beckett event, so maybe there's a few things from Beckett, but, you know, really light. The best coverage was probably definitely on Beckett Radio. Uh, so if you're listening to this podcast, obviously you've, you're have uh, you attuned to being able to find podcasts and sit down and find some time to listen to it. Probably going to want to go over and listen to, they have just a plethora of interviews. Some of these guys have been interviewed so many, not to criticize uh, the show. It's not certainly not their fault. Again, only uh, like 50 people are at this freaking uh, show uh, at the summit. So there's only so many people to choose from, but so you can, uh, you know, it's only, there's only so many times you can hear from Mike Fruitman from, you know, Mike Stadium sports cards or whatever, the card shop owner. Only so many times you can hear Tracy Hackler, to, you know, spout his BS and, uh, you know, various guys that you're, you've heard 
you know, a half dozen times being interviewed over the years. But there's certainly some ones in here that were good. Brian Gray, I think that was one of their very first interviews. That was a great interview, actually. Uh, he even teed up, kind of teased kind of a, a nasty competi pit competition between Leaf and Upper Deck to sign some of the best young hockey talent. Certainly, they don't like each other very much at all there. Uh, I think uh, the, uh, uh, some more things that might be useful. Somebody from Becca Grading got on. I mean, Becca Grading is getting swamped right now. The whole grading industry is just getting swamped with cards. It's part of the, one of the reasons that's really fueling the growth in the card industry because savvy dealers, as we t had a whole show talking about a power seller, eBay power seller who does this, savvy people who understand a grading game are getting cards grading and exponentially exploding the value of their cards and then reselling these cards on eBay. Not that many people, when you talk to people, even who casually buy sports cards or maybe semi-serious about sports cards, they maybe not feel comfortable about sending their stuff across the country in a box and, and getting it back, you know, two or three weeks later, or who knows when it's going to come back. But there are a lot of people are, these companies are getting swamped right now, BGS and PSA, and they're looking to hire people and, and uh, just having problems with scale. So there's probably some good insight. I didn't listen to it that much, but uh, some long discussions there about, you know, that business there. Uh, additional coverage. Again, this was like the only piece of information, only coverage from the summit that was semi-useful. And this is really sad because there's only a handful of people that um, are going to sit down and listen to a podcast or a radio show. It's certainly more of a niche audience um you know social media is out there you've got a lot of different ways video lots of different ways that this could have been presented more effectively but uh at least we have some of these podcasts tim from check out my cards interesting interview again f for me to listen to again a longtime user of the site and oh update please how many cards have i sold today for anybody that thinks you can't sell cards on checking my cards, I have sold 686 cards today. Today on check out my cards. 686 cards. So good day on checking my cards. Tim, he says he's over a hundred employees. That's really good because last time I talked to him at the national, he was about 70 or 75. He says he has 40 people in his shipping department. So imagine that. Imagine if you woke up every day and you had 40 people packing and shipping cards for you. Imagine how many orders that is. This is a serious, serious business. He has 50 people kind of working in the card listing. There's a lot of people sending him cards. Again, this is more savvy people who are maybe in the card game. They don't want to list these little refractors and these little parallels that are worth a buck here, buck there, buck there, but they'd They'd rather maximize the value and sending them in the cart to check out my cards works for them. You know, smaller part-time sellers also works for them. People that just want to, you know, no hassle list their stuff. He is getting swamped. He, again, the similar to like Becca grading and PSA, scaling the business, going from, you know, he bought 20,000 cards on eBay and put them on his website. And that was like his test, you know, to test his website to going from that to now he's managing a hundred employees and two distribution center. One interesting thing, I don't want to spoil, I'm like spoiling what's at, what he said in the interview. They had it. They have about three or four hours in interviews. So uh, you can go through and enjoy many. These are just a couple that I thought were interesting. One thing that Tim from Check On My Card said is that he, he is, because right now, in order to work for this company, he's hiring. First of all, if you need a job, if I was flat broke, I would go move to Washington and work in this company because I could probably get pretty high because he needs people knowledgeable about sports cards. That is like a big hang up for him. He can find people to ship cards. Probably he can find some card listing. That's pretty hard. He can find his 10 admin and HR people, but finding people to know about sports cards. Again, that's very hard. We've talked about it on this show, how valuable that is, how valuable that is to know about sports cards. I've made hundreds of, I probably will make over, well over a million dollars in my life because I know about sports cards. I've already made hundreds of hundreds of thousands of dollars on websites, which are super high margin 
um, and low cost to set up. So these are things that are very valuable. And Tim, you know, he needs these people. He needs people to know about sports cards. He might, and well, it sounds like he's already got something maybe going in Dallas where he's having some people work remotely, probably to ID and list cards after they have been scanned. But it sounds like he wants to set up some offices all across the country and um, kind of, uh, you know, be working on a card. Maybe it's something I should talk to him about because that sounds like uh, something that would be fun uh, to, to do because um, he needs people. Again, he's getting cards uh, sent to him by the day and he has 40 people shipping stuff out. So he's trying to grow this business and scale is a huge problem for for him as it is with a lot of people in this industry tops now we i believe maybe the second episode or third episode i think it was titled tops now isn't all that so this doesn't surprise me that the fact that these print runs for the the amount of times that they hype this thing and uh, certainly if you talk to tops employees it's one of the things that are at the tip of their tongue is this tops now program just the other day they, they actually hired Noah Syndergaard of the Mets an outstanding pitcher just unbelievable maybe one of the best pitchers in the game definitely one of the best pitchers in the game uh, if not uh, you know in top five for sure they hired him as an intern it was obviously an off day when he wasn't pitching and uh, you know had a press release in New York and all this kind of stuff and Bartolo Colon came up and they had the card from last year which I think they sold 8,000 copies Pretty low print runs to start the year if you compare them to last year. Really not that anything to write home about. About the same flat or down from last year. The spring training sets that they sold for a long time. They had a long time to sell those. Print runs pretty low on those. Compare, you know, if you really look at them. I don't know if they're making a lot of money selling sets for 50 bucks that they're only going to make 50 on there that they only make 50 of them some of the pro ones were really low there now maybe there's some return on investments for people who bought them and they're able to flip these cards but i don't really know they started a i don't really know because there's only so many times when you get these are four dollar base cards i was reading a discussion the other day they were like oh i think the steven piscotti or somebody is a, is a good deal i was like the cheapest you can buy them is 20 for $4, so 80 bucks total. When on earth is a Stevens Piscotti, even at a low print well, to like 200 when is a Steven Piscotti number to 200 worth very much? Or in most of these guys. And obviously the higher you go up on the print run, like the Madison Bumgarner was numbered to eight, it was eight, an 810 card print run. That, that's a lot. That's not worth four bucks. That might be worth 25, 50 cents. So there's only so many times you can sell these $4 kind of base cards over and over and every day of the season. It just doesn't work. So what they've done, and I'm wondering, you know, if you got to see some of the internal metrics here, that that, that the business model is actually different than maybe I think it, it would be as to sell as many cards as you can and reach as many cards as, as many people as you possibly can. They've started this loyalty program for the like the biggest, it looks like the biggest buyers from last year. Uh, got like these you know they're going to get all these autographs and a special party and then they're going to get stroked off maybe this is kind of like i was reading something about like legal gambling in canada or something or the slot machine legal online slot machine in canada or something and the entire industry was propped up by like 60 players like it's like countrywide this whole thing but it really comes down to like these core 60 players basically prop up this entire industry and maybe uh you know maybe that's a little bit and i know the same thing you see that with apps like you, uh, a lot of times you know all these free apps and these games they're literally like hoping that a very very small percentage of their players will turn into whales and just spend money and spend thousands of dollars at least for a short period of time on these apps they don't care about the free play they definitely don't care if you're playing for free and they definitely don't care if you're playing for a dollar here a dollar there they're really just shooting for the top to get you to 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 get the you hooked and get a, a whale uh, to spend thousands of dollars maybe that's the goal here with this tops now they don't care about milking every last card for four or five to ten dollars that they can they just want the core guys the flippers or however these guys are you know why these guys buy these cards 
Maybe some of them collect them or they try to build the whole set. They just need a certain percentage of these to turn into core guys and they'll just milk these guys dry and give them little loyalty cards and all a party and, stra- uh, and pat them on the back and tell them how nice they are for spending money at Tops now. But again, there's only so much you can do with a $4 base card. Uh, it's not that exciting. You know, none of this is very exciting. It's not like even like a blind pack. It's not even like, you know, the excitement of opening a pack. Tops gets to decide who's, you know, basically gets to decide when these cards, uh, who's going to be on these cards. And then, you, you know, it's a set price. You either buy them or not. So, eh, you know, not that interesting. But we'll talk about something that's far more interesting. And that's Upper Deck and E-Pack. Upper Deck starting to sell these uh, minted gold and silver coins. And they look really really nice actually um every you know i've had so many people kind of email or reach out to me oh these are so expensive yeah well no kidding they're expensive and i sure as heck is not going to pay a hundred dollars for you know seventeen dollars of silver uh, or you know no way in heck i would do that but again this is where you have to be a little bit more proactive and have been on the EPAC site for a long time. And I've built up quite a collection on there. Again, I've had a Matthews and I have a McDavid sitting over there and I have four, I have about four or 5,000 cards sitting on the upper deck EPAC site. And over 700 of these packs have been purchased for a hundred dollars each. That's $70,000 getting deposited right into upper decks bank account. Over 700 of these coins have been purchased on Upper Deck EPAC. At some point, there'll probably be like thousands of these coins on EPAC. That, that'll be great for me because I'll be able to cherry pick them. I think they're worth about 5 or $10 over spot. Now, obviously, the Sidney Crosby and the Connor McDavid and the Ovechkin and some of the other guys, Taze, they're going to be more of a premium. They're going to obviously sell for a much more of a premium. They have different parallels. Each, they have like the base coin is numbered to 5,000, like a huge print run on there. They're, and then there's parallels. And then the gold ones, the gold ones are really hard to hit out of the packs. And uh, they're numbered to something I can't remember. But the gold ones are super hard to get. There's probably about, there's 600, over 600 silver coins on EPAC. And there's like five gold coins that you could see that are alive. Super hard to hit they're also going to be sold in canada through a bank i don't know how uh, you know how many branches this bank has or you know how popular this bank is but they are going to be available online and at this bank and you can buy them singly and i for 100 canadian which sounds like a good deal if you're in canada that might even work out if you have u.s dollar and you can also buy them like sets of four and different size packs. Again, it's a total ripoff at a hundred bucks. Again, so the the price of silver right now is like seventeen bucks or something. So, you know, they're selling you seventeen dollars. It's an ounce of silver. They're selling you seventeen dollars of silver for a hundred bucks, and they're slapping Sidney Crosby's face on it, charging you a premium. For me, the reason why I'm excited, and I, you know, I don't care what the price is. It doesn't matter to me. I'll be patient. I'll wait till there's thousands of these coins available on Upper Deck EPAC and they traded all these different hands and people don't care that they just spent $100. You know, it's hard to pry one of these loose right now on Upper Deck EPAC because the person who got it just had to pay $100 for it. So in their mind, it's worth at least $100 in trade value. But again, as more time goes on, more of these coins come on live, let people are less detached from when they just bought it for a hundred dollars. It's, you know, way far down the line. This coin has just been sitting there. You can't even send them to check out my cards right now. You either have to ship them to yourself uh, and sell it on eBay, or you just got to leave it on the EPAC site. So these are going to be traded and they're going to be traded for hockey cards when people want them. And uh, that's going to be a great, great day for me. Cause you're literally going to be able to trade cards for gold and silver. And I see these being worth, in trade value, if you could get these for a slightly above spot, which would be about twenty dollars, if you could get these for twenty dollars in trade value on Upper Deck Epac, I will be sitting on Upper Deck Epac all day, getting these coins, scooping up as many coins of these as I can. This might be one thing that could pry a McDavid loose for me. Is if you give me basically the equivalent, like if so, if a McDavid is worth, I think the lowest price right now is three hundred dollars. On uh, check out my cards for a Connor McDavid Young Gun rookie. So if you gave me twenty one ounce uh, silver coins at, and they're worth seventeen dollars each, 
I certainly that would get me thinking. So, really exciting. I uh, it kind of came out of nowhere. I love how they dropped it. The upper deck was not at the summit, but I love how they dropped this news during the summit to kind of hijack some of the coverage. I think this is really interesting. People are going to buy these again. Over seventy, they've sold over seventy to seventy-five thousand dollars at least of these. These are just the ones I can see. A lot of people lock them and a lot of people probably instantly ship them to themselves. They have no interest in trading them and they don't want anybody to know that they have them. They maybe have sold over $100,000 worth of these coins already just on the EPAC site, let alone the business they've done with this Canada bank and people coming in. People will buy these. Again, a Connor McDavid non-serial number, non-autograph rookie card is worth $300. You think they're not going to spend a hundred bucks on a gold or silver coin? Of course they will. These are going to sell. And I can't wait to get um, several of these. Very excited about that. I encourage you to check it out. If you have an Upper Deck E-Pack, is one of the most exciting and best things going in this hobby. Um, it, you know, Check out my cards. As, I've said this before. This is like a slogan of mine. Check out my cards is fun, but Upper Deck E-Pack blows it away. Way more fun. Way more fun to be able to trade with people. Um, and, uh, you know, for me, it's just so rewarding to have built up some of these cards and I have, you know, every day I log in and get my free pack. I maybe make a trade here, a trade there. Boom. Now the added value that there's going to be thousands of these silver and gold, real silver and gold coins on something that I have actually here. Yeah, I have some Canada mint coins here. I have, um, ounces of gold in my stock portfolio and silver in my stock portfolio. It's something I've been keeping track of the price of gold and silver, for a couple years actually. So it's exciting that these have landed on Upper Deck EPAC. I'm certainly excited. I can see the value in them. Certainly I could see how people could be sticker shocked and shocked by the price, but who cares? Where there's shock, where there's dismay, where there's hesitation, there's opportunity. And I will be, there will be a podcast where I talk about the dozens and hopefully uh, scores or hundreds of silver and gold coins I got off Upper Deck EPAC. Amazon. Wow. Do I freaking love Amazon? I cannot believe uh, this channel has not been exploited more by people in the hobby. Uh, just astonishing. I've sold, uh, gosh dang, 47 things in the last few days. That's great news. Not everything's all fun and roses. I sent in a dozen items the other day and it, seven have still not not the other day about a month ago and seven has still not come live i've sent in hundreds of more items that have all come in live since then so at some point i'm going to have to do something about these missing seven boxes and if they come live this is one of the things about not controlling your inventory you're not exactly sure what happened here but I'm sure we'll get that all worked out. These are just things that, uh, you know, kinks and things to uh, account for. It's certainly not going to be always smooth sailing. What has been smooth sailing is the advertising has really worked. I have sold, I have, again, I don't have enough inventory to like, bla I would love to just like blast through a bunch of advertising if I had, if I could support it, if I had a, a you know, a certain skew that I had 500 sitting there ready to go and I could just blast through 10, $20 in advertising a day just to that one uh, thing or more. I just don't have that amount of inventory yet. I'm trying to catch up to that point, but boy, the little, the limited advertising I have used has really, really worked. And, um, it really works if, especially if your product, um, and this really works across Amazon. This not is just something, you know, in tune to sports cards, but if, it, if it's a product, maybe that, that, uh, maybe is a little lower down in the search results, something that, that, uh, maybe is a, a you, you had to create your own listing and it might be hard for people to find your listing on Amazon. Advertising is a great way to boost your thing, uh, you know, higher Never be scared about advertising, whether that be on Twitter, on Facebook, on Google, on Amazon, on eBay. I saw an eBay seller the other day just complaining, just ranting and raving and complaining how eBay was going to put advertising on th their listings on eBay. And I was thinking to myself, well, you're noticing the ads. Why don't you advertise there then? 
<laughs> you know, they complain about how their competitors are going to be seen on their on their listings. Well, why don't you advertise on their listings? So a lot of people are so short-sighted and really, frankly, not very intelligent when it comes to business in this game. Maybe that's why this Amazon opportunity is still available. But that's all the insight I'm going to give today there on Amazon. eBay, though, um, I've probably sold about a dozen things. Some things have gone well. One of my best sales, actually, I bought a New York Yankees spring training tickets. This is how... This is an example of how, you know, the ticket game can really fluctuate from year to year. Last year in 2016, I probably made like 10 or $15,000 or more on the Yankee spring training games. And there's only like 17 spring training games. So I absolutely hit it out of the park. There was one game, I think, where I made like two or 3,000 bucks, like a random Tuesday. Random things occurred that allowed that to happen. This year, I lost money. On my Yankee spring training tickets. I literally lost money. Last year I made ten or 15000 on all my Yankee tickets. This year I lost money. So you can see from year to year. I could have been doing a podcast for a whole year. Talking about. Boy the real opportunity is buy Yankee season tickets. And last year I made X amount of dollars. And here's my spreadsheet that shows all my fees. Yeah, you've been in flat wrong. Because trust me there would have been no way that I could have. You know breaking even. I probably maybe could have got. A little above even. But it wasn't. There was no way the opportunity wasn't there to make ten or fifteen thousand dollars in a month like you could last year. Just it, some circumstances had changed there, but I did get bailed out slightly because in one of my season ticket packages they sent me a Tops Now Gary Sanchez. Hope that's I hope I'm the right guy. Gary Sanchez of the uh, New York Yankees. Uh, prospect rookie kid a uh, special tops now card in the season ticket pack that had um on the code on the back was a 25 percent off discount to tops now and i was like oh that's pretty cool i'm going to use the code and then i'll sell the card maybe uh after the code expires it expired in may and i was like oh, i'll sell the i'll sell the card for 10 bucks or something and, and that'll be cool I'm sitting there looking at some things actually on the blowout form. I was looking at a Tops Now thread to see what people were talking about. And somebody posted in the thread. They were like, oh, one of those season ticket holder Yankee card just sold for 72 bucks." And I was like, hot dang, I got one of those. So I put mine on there for 99 bucks, And sure enough, like 20 minutes later, I got an offer for 80 bucks, And I just went ahead and accepted it there. So that was a free gift from the Yankees that helped me get a little closer to even on the loss of my season tickets. That's my best eBay sales. That's a long way to get around to saying that was probably my best eBay sale of the month, the $80. Had a couple other good sales, but I've also had some mishaps. I had two mishaps. Let me talk about those. First of all, I sent the wrong Golden State Warriors shorts to somebody. Oops. Um, I bought like a dozen, I don't know, maybe like 10, uh, golden state warrior shorts. For some reason I can get golden state Warriors stuff on closeout, which I know is a for sure good deal because there's people all across the country who have become fans of that team and don't have access to their licensed merchandise that I, you know, take for granted that I see this stuff every day. So I got some warrior shorts for a really good deal. Sold like all of them really quick. Uh, <laughs> One problem was is that one of them that I bought was a different style than the ones I had listed. And when I was selling them, I was just grabbing them out of the plastic bag and throwing them in the in the in the mailer and sending them off. And so I had mistakenly sent this person the wrong warrior shorts and he contacted me about it. He said, hey, you sent me the wrong shorts. And I was like, oh, what do you mean? I thought maybe I'd send him the wrong size or maybe it wasn't. And then he showed me the picture and I was like, oh, dang it. Those gosh, dang it. Those would have sold. So I told him. Uh, you know, again, this is a this isn't a business I'm really trying to make money off of, believe it or not. At least with eBay, with Amazon, I'm going to take it much more serious. With eBay, I don't really care. I would probably actually prefer to lose money for tax purposes in my own. You know, I have a profitable business already. I certainly uh, wouldn't really want something uh, to be extremely profitable with his eBay thing, considering how much time it takes up. So I told the guy, hang on to the ones you got. And uh, thankfully, I had another pair. I had like my last pair sitting over here. So I sent them those. So that's, again, a huge write down because I, you know, I sold them a pair. But then now I had to then at my own expense, send them another pair. So we wrote that uh, we wrote that down 
And um, that was, again, a mistake on my part. That's something that could have been avoided if I had just uh, sent him the right shorts. I would have then had another listing, uh, cool warrior shorts that I sent him. I should have listed those. And then another weird thing happened. Uh, another, I sold an Alabama Crimson Tide sweater for 20 bucks. I think I bought only bought it for like two or three bucks, brand new. And the buyer contacted me and say, hey, I haven't got this yet. And I'm like, oh, that's weird. That was like two weeks ago. And I click on the tracking number and I'd sent it FedEx smart post. And sure enough, the thing was like stuck in Bell Gardens, California, which is about six hours from where I live. And I was like, and it was stuck there for like a week, a week and a half. And I was like, that's, that sucks. So I mailed a person back. I said, Hey man, that really apologize about that. Not really sure uh, what's going on there. I'm going to, uh, this was a few days ago. I was like, let's give it till Friday. If you don't have your, the, if you don't have it by Friday, if it hasn't, something hasn't shaken loose by Friday, I'll send you a refund. And so I woke up today and saw that nothing had happened with the tracking number. Still said that it was stuck in Bell Garden. This was something I shipped last month too. I mean, I shipped this out like two weeks ago. Thing was stuck. And so I just, I just refunded the person. They were very grateful actually that I, uh, that I had refunded them. Sure enough, just like a few hours later, the thing had, uh, <laughs> sure enough, like a few hours later, the, the tracking had updated and it had made it out to Tennessee. So I had actually told him in the email, I said, you know what? You're probably going to get this, but who knows? It could take another week. It could come tomorrow. Uh, but eventually this sweater will probably show up. These things usually don't come missing. Um, but you might have to be patient. They're very grateful for the refund. And again, that was FedEx smart post. So I was like, Oh, that's a little sketchy. I had to use FedEx smart post the other day, actually yesterday, cause I sold four boxes of Yu-Gi-Oh on eBay and the guy lived in Panoma, California, which is about, uh, that's in Southern California. So that's about six hours away from me. And it was only $5. It was like four pounds because it was four boxes. Four pounds to ship to him, but it was only like $5 on FedEx Smart Post. It would have been like 10 plus on USPS. So I had to send it to him FedEx Smart Post, even knowing that one that had gone down there had come up delayed or missing. I just had to do it because that's the savings of $5 there. So two little hiccups there on eBay. And again, I have seven boxes on Amazon that are in purgatory that are just floating who knows where. So we're waiting on those. Other than that, things have gone well, and I'm happy how that's gone. Couple questions to close out the show. This comes from Alan in Canada. Hi there. I love your podcast. I listen to it religiously. I like that. Not just for the card stuff, but for the Amazon, eBay, and StubHub tips. I used to sell a lot on StubHub and want to get back into the game eventually. Do you have an ebook or mastermind for your StubHub business? Just warning, let me know. Um, I did do a video a couple years back. It was the first year I did it. I did a video, and it's really a primer. Uh, there are, I'll say this, there are a lot of different ways to scalp tickets. A lot. Some of them, some of them may or may not be legal. I think the first thing that I would do, you're in Canada. So I'm very familiar with the laws in the United States. And then obviously each state can has sometimes very different laws in terms of scalping online and, uh, you know, that whole process and then taxes and, and things like that. You're in Canada. I would look, you used to sell a lot, so you're probably familiar at least a little bit with how how this works. I would definitely look in your area, what's legal, what's not. Uh, You might have to like register your business. I know in certain states, like in New York and Chicago, I basically try to stay out of those states because there are very, there are more restrictions, there's registration. So I literally, I sell New York Yankees spring training tickets, but those games are in Florida and not in New York. I stay out of, I try to stay out of the New York and Illinois markets because there are certain laws. California is very liberal, very free and easy in terms of ticketing because you think about it, StubHub's based here, and I believe Ticketmaster is also based here, so they can just pump money into politicians' pockets uh, to get uh, legislation done here. So that's first. You really need to figure out what is legal, what is not. There are many different ways to 
scalp sports tickets. I could probably do four different podcasts breaking down literally different ways to do it. I've figured out my own way to do it literally from flipping cards to on check out my cards and uh, just evolving from that. Uh, honestly, I make a, most of my money, probably I would say 80 to 90% of the money I make flipping sports tickets is all done within the last 48, 24 to 48 hours of an event. Even this morning, I was selling opening day baseball tickets literally like an hour up until the start get, the start of the game. I love being, you know, the last minute seller Um, and being familiar with the rules of selling last minute tickets and, you know, where you can list those tickets. Even today, I sold tickets on a platform I had never used before. And I was that could open up so many more opportunities for me. There are so many different ways to do it. I'm able to focus a lot on my own local market. I'm very lucky. I live next to, you know, two NFL sports teams, uh, four or five different basketball uh, teams are in this state. I mean, there are just events and big sporting events and concerts going on all the time. I got very lucky and rode the Golden State Warriors wave. I started selling Warriors tickets before they even made the finals, uh, before they won their first title a few years ago. I got on the wait. They had a wait list for season tickets before they won the NBA finals. I mean, this has been a hot ticket for many, many years, all the way back to like the run TMC days with Mullen, uh, Tim Hardaway and Mitch Richmond back in like the early nineties. This has been a hot ticket. And obviously that area is flush with cash and I'm pretty low down on the wait list. When they build a new stadium, it looks like I'm going to have an opportunity to buy PSL tickets. I focused on my own local market and figured out my own way to do it. So I don't really have an ebook or a mastermind or even frankly, anybody I learned from. I literally just came up with a lot of this on my own trial and error. You buy tickets, you sell tickets, you see what works and see what doesn't. Again, I concentrate on my own area and I really like to be able to get a lot. I like to get off a lot of tickets. uh, That's one reason why I concentrate on football because there's 70,000 people who may may go to a football game, sometimes more for these big college games or a big NFL stadium could have more. So there's a lot of tickets floating around. And uh, so you can acquire, like for a Niner game, I might have 500 tickets. Good, good actually stories from last year, the Dodgers and Padres played on opening day in San Diego. And last year, the All-Star game was actually in San Diego as well. So the the Padres were really aggressive selling season ticket packages and holding back some opening day tickets to try to coin you into buying a package to then get these All-Star tickets in June. And I kind of knew this. And I actually ended up with about five. It was ended up being at roughly about 5% of the total tickets for opening day for the Padres. I spent roughly, they were mostly lower end tickets. And I think I spent... 55 or 60,000 in the course of a month acquiring about 5% of the inventory for the Padres and just basically selling them in that last week. Uh, you know, they're playing the Dodgers. Kershaw was pitching. It was a Monday afternoon, just like this, uh, or, uh, no, actually it was a Monday. It was a today's Friday. It was actually a Monday game an afternoon game. And I was able to get rid of all those tickets. It wasn't a huge win for me. I think off the 55, I only made like 12, which isn't a huge win in sports tickets. What is that? That's uh, that's only like 20. That's a, barely a, a, a 20% margin there. But for baseball, that's actually not bad. And for the amount of tickets I had, I mean, I was controlling a huge percentage of the secondary market. So I like to be able to get off a lot of tickets. But again, it's not something I can really like you know, right down. Cause last year I made 10 or 15,000 on Yankees spring training in a month. Like, you know, spring training is one month long, boom, 10 or $15,000 profit, boom, right in your pocket. This year I lost money. So every year it's different. You have to really adapt and know the rules about selling, know, you know, all the exclusive relationships involved with ticketing. Uh, you know, again, just today I used another platform that I had never used and it's and something sold. And I was like, well, hello, I need to, I need to get this going. Uh, financing comes into play a lot. I know I'm going on and on here, but you got to have money or you got to have money or you got to have credit. 
Um, so don't, you know, when you make your first 10,000, don't go out and buy a seven series Beamer or don't go out and buy a, you know, brand new house and don't just go spending that money. You're going to need that money or you're going to need some kind of line of credit to, you know, ramp up. Cause again, you know, when I, you know, I spent 55,000 in a month on Padres tickets. What if, you know, ISIS bombed us or something and all those became worthless or what if the, you know, it was just pouring down rain that day and they had to reschedule it. And it, I mean, it could have been a potential nightmare. So you're taking a lot of risk and, um, uh, you obviously want to start small. You don't want to buy 50,000 t- tickets to one game, uh, without having, you know, sold, ba- I'd probably sold baseball tickets for two years. And I just saw that set up. I just saw that set up. I had an opportunity to buy tickets early on, like in mid February, and I just kept buying, 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 buying really all the way up until the last few days. And then, you know, to be perfectly honest, I was in the I remember keeping track on my spreadsheet. I wasn't I was still at a loss like two or three hours before the game. It was literally in the last two or three hours that I made all my profit that 12 or 15,000. I can't remember how much I made on that game, but all that 12 or 15,000 literally came in the last two hours. Just boom. So that's what I really focus on is the last 24 to 48 hours of an event. That way I know the weather. I know if the quarterback's playing. I know the mood of the fan base. I know the, the, the everything that's going to, everything that's uncontrollable. You know, the mood of the fans, the weather, what's going on in the country, interest. Last 24 to 48 hours, you're really locked in. And there's a lot of people who can't go. You know, that's when they find out they can't go. So they're selling. So I'm buying a shit, uh, a crap ton of stuff in the last 24 to 48 hours and I'm unloading it like boom, 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 boom. And so you've obviously got to sit there and grind out hours after hours. Days I get up at 3 a.m. and I don't go to bed until midnight. So you're literally putting in, you're putting in a, you know, 20 hour day. Now you might make 10 grand that day, but you know, that does have side effects that does have that does have big side effects, believe me. And that's something that I've had to learn to turn the computer off, to go lay down when I know I'm losing three, four hundred, five hundred dollars an hour by doing it. But it's something you have to force yourself to do. So if you ever start to make a lot of money, you almost have to force yourself to shut it down at times. And that's why I do different stuff. That's why I do this podcast. Why I do, I do Amazon. I still keep up on my website. I've got like 200 people on my Beanie Baby site right now. I should be working on that. I like to do other stuff because I'm not going to sit here and grind, 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 grind for uh, hours and on hours a day. I don't care how much money that is. Another question. This is from Isaac. Hey, I'm an upstart uh, ticket scalper. I own two sets of season uh, Louisville basketball and football and USC football. Nice. Um, I don't know if that's uh, Southern California or... Uh, uh, South Carolina. I'm from Indiana. I've also flipped a pair of Sweet 16 and Elite 8 tickets from the Midwest reason. Nice. And I am now trying to get into reselling concert tickets and such. I was beat on City Presale this morning for Lady Gaga. I was beat by bots. Can you offer me any advice? Also, are bots legal? Do you know anything I should uh, do just to get a base start on how to get tickets and be able to resell them? Bots are... This is a very gray area. Technically, the the bots may not be illegal. It's against terms of service. I do not use bots, uh, first of all. Uh, I'm very proud to say this is when I'm talking. This is what I mentioned earlier. There are a lot of different ways to scalp tickets. And there are a lot of ways to make a lot of money scalping tickets. And one way are these guys who use bots. I'll give you one example. This, I I believe, actually, there was some legal consequences because, again, it was in New York, and they're very strict in New York. This uh, huge seller bot ring or whatever, Beyonce was doing a pre-sale. And what these bots do is they literally, when these tickets go on sale, they scoop every single ticket that's available, or practically all of them, literally almost all of them, that's why when you're going on Ticketmaster and you're refreshing and there's nothing there because there's a bot literally on every, just, almost every big pre-sale event, scoops every single ticket, puts everything in a hold window. And so then what happens is, is then a scalper or somebody that's real goes through and clicks, okay, that's, uh, 
I want these ones. I want these ones. Oh, I don't want those ones. Those are in the upper level, way in the corner. Nobody wants those. I want these ones. I want to. He literally just like cherry picks all the ones he wants because they give you like time to hold the tickets. He's literally cherry picking all the ones he wants, releases the ones you don't. That's why if you keep hitting refresh, some will pop up and they're usually like horrible way out in the in the distance, but you buy those anyways. So this guy literally cherry. There was a Beyonce ticket. Where this guy, these bot, this one bot guy literally got like 90% of the inventory for the entire freaking show. Um, that, that, if you're doing that in New York or if you're doing that in any type of high profile environment, uh, you could get caught and there could be some big consequences there. Um, there, again, there are so many different ways to scalp tickets. I try to do everything by the book, by ticket limits, by, uh, I obviously don't use a bot. Uh, there was one time when my IP address got shut down by Ticketmaster because they thought I was using a bot. And I kept calling and emailing customer service saying, hey, can you unblock my account? I'm trying to buy thousands of dollars of tickets like every second here. Can you unblock me? And it literally took at, well, after three days, I was still not unblocked. They kept saying, okay, yeah, I'll just give it another 10, 15 minutes. You'll be good. And on and on. This happened like two or three different times. I was calling and, you know, I'm a pretty patient person. But when we're talking about my prime selling season and I'm locked out of Ticketmaster, at least in my home computer, I had to go elsewhere. I was pretty ticked off. So what I did, um, which is a very unprecedented move and a very rare step on my part, I tweeted the CEO told him I'm having problem I'm locked out of this account. I've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, what, what the F is going on? Not, I didn't say that, but I say, Hey, what's going on? Sure enough, 20 minutes later, somebody tweeted, somebody, uh, some customer service manager in like Michigan tweeted me. I emailed them. I said, Hey, they think, uh, you know, I'm getting locked out for bots. Definitely hundred percent not using a bot. Um, you know, three days I've sent emails. I've tried to be, you know, cool, but I need something done here within like five minutes. My account was back and I have never been locked out since. So in drastic measures, you've got to, you know, contact the, uh, the proper authority. So I tweeted the CEO of the company. I don't use bots. I don't like bots. I think they're stupid. I don't buy a lot of my tickets on presale either. Again, there are a lot of different ways to buy and sell sports tickets. Most people think season ticket packages and buying these pre-sales and doing this and this event. I focus on the last 24 to 48 hours. I'm on the resale markets. I'm on anywhere where I might be able to buy a ticket for a good price and be able to flip it. Check out my card style, similar to the, how you would flip a card on checking my cards. That's my game. That's my game. Pre-sales, I could care less. I could really care less. So I'm the worst person probably... Um, to ask about pre-sales. I've got, oh my God, just countless questions about uh, sports tickets. Hi, Ryan, I'm getting uh, serious into buying selling tickets. Done a couple events, seen your video, which was a big help. Just wanted to ask whether you had experience buying Ticketmaster ticket Platinum seats, as I've noticed a nice profit between some and resale price. My main worry is whether they're stricter on entry and the fact that they say on some tickets will be delivered at least 48 hours to event. As I know, StubHub only gives you about seven days before the event to send them. You know, the thing with a lot of artists, I know Garth Brook does this, where you have to use your credit card or your ID to get into the event. One way around this is you as the ticket broker would, so if you're buying Garth Brook tickets that require a credit card entry or an ID entry, what you would do is you buy, would buy a bunch of prepaid Visa cards, Buy the car, buy the tickets that you're going to scalp on that prepaid card. Turn around, go list them on StubHub or Tickets Now or SeatGeek or wherever you're selling tickets. Vivid Seats. I mean, there's a hundred million sites now, or maybe you're able to cross list onto all of them. There's programs and services that do that. Cross list onto every ticket site, and then when those tickets sell, you're obviously going to have to mail. There might be a, a ticket, and then also that prepaid gift card in uh, the envelope to the buyer so that then that buyer uses that prepaid gift card to get in. That's the loophole. When you see restrictions, when you see exclusives, 
when you see these things in the ticket market, that shouldn't get you dis discouraged. And this is one of my biggest tips. It should get you excited and you should be like, oh, cool. There's a there's these tickets are hard to buy and sell. You've got to have an ID or it's got these platinum seats that you get 48 hours behind. And th those are all things that I love. Again, the more you know the rules, the more you know the restrictions, the more you know the exclusives, the more you know how everything works the more money you can make and you can exploit that sometimes in your favor. There are a lot of ways to scalp tickets. That's one reason why I'm comfortable talking about it and maybe less comfortable probably in the future talking about my Amazon success because there's probably only a few ways to make money on Amazon and a few handful of products. In, 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 in scalping uh, tickets, there are events every single freaking day that there is an opportunity, every day. There's events across the world and certainly across the United States where there is an opportunity to be made. So I certainly don't mind talking about it. If you have any questions about it, shoot me uh, an email. Uh, again, it requires money. You need a lot of money to lever yourself up. And it's one reason why I've always lived. I know somebody emailed the show a little while back. He, he was like, oh, Ryan, you, he's not a baller. He said that he rented a place and he had a 2003 Volvo and he said this. He must not be a real baller. Da, 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 da. I've lived modestly my whole life. So when I started to get money, the last thing I wanted to do was go buy stuff. I've had stuff. I've had cars. I've had a 19 fucking 68 Camaro, which would fucking smoke just about any car that you could drive by. You could buy a hundred thousand dollar car and I could drive by in the 68 Camaro that I had in college and more people would be looking at me. Stuff doesn't mean shit. Money means a lot. And I need money to one, pay my taxes <laughs> and two, lever up my business year to year because I started about three or four years ago, made quite a bit. Next year, made quite a bit more. Next year, made quite a bit more. Last year, made a shit ton. And you can guess what I'm going to try to do this year. Make a shit ton more and just keep levering, levering and levering it up. The only way you could do that is if you have money. The more money you have, the more money you can make in sports tickets, especially once you have that knowledge because you're ready to go gamble and buy 5% of the Padres inventory at $55,000 because you know you're going to chop out, you know, you know it's going to be an easy 10, 20%. Unless the weather's bad or ice is for some reason bomb San Diego or just some weird quirky things happen. Clayton Kershaw's pitching. The Dodgers are a local team too. San Diego's a great market. All-Star Games that year, they sold a lot of season tickets, a lot of tickets locked up, a lot of tickets didn't come available until the very end, and guess who was buying those? I was trying to lock up everything. I was selling to Dodger fans. I was selling to Padre fans. I was moving those tickets. But it takes a lot. It takes money. It takes knowledge. More restrictions there are, like these Ticketmaster Platinum seats or, you know, this this is exclusive over here. This is an exclusive ticket opportunity over here. The better. The more confusing it is, the better. Because once you're able to figure it out, you're able to exploit it. We're in an hour. I was trying to do a 30-minute show. Disaster. Send me emails. Uh, sportscardshow at gmail.com. Twitter, sportscard, news, mail. 4545 Georgetown Place, Suite C34, Stockton, California, 95207. Carpets in, paints in, looks brand new. I got to get some furniture, got some computers, got to hire an employee, got to get them to start grinding. Got that coming up in the next few months. So, knock out a couple podcasts. Hope you guys enjoy. Get off your feet. If you're working too hard, trust me, go take a nap, go take a vacation. It helps a lot.